most of our modern technology is developed off the back of previous inventions. Someone comes up with an idea, and that idea is then refined for tens or even hundreds of years, resulting in more efficient products and processes. Because of that, we sometimes lose sight of just how old and how far ahead of their time some of the world's most ancient inventions were. From weapons to convenience aids, here are some of the most outstanding technological achievements of the ancient world. Whenever the weather outside turns cold and you switch on your central heating, remember to thank the ancient Romans. They came up with the idea. The ancient Roman equivalent of the kind of central heating we know and love today was the hypocaust. They were a common feature in the homes of wealthy people in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. Seneca, one of the most popular and respected writers of the era, had a hypocaust in his villa and wrote of it often. He considered it to be the height of luxury, and he was probably right. To make a hypocaust, Roman builders included spaces between the walls and floors of new buildings. They'd then place a fireplace into the corner of the building. The heat generated by the fire entered the spaces between the floors and walls and heated the entire property. With a big enough fire and an intelligent enough design, a single hypocaust system would be sufficient to heat a whole Roman bathhouse. This simple but effective design remained in use for several centuries. In fact, there's no reason why it couldn't be used in parts of the world where no central heating exists today. There's no shortage of interesting ancient buildings in Athens, Greece, but precious few that serve such a specific scientific purpose as the Tower of Winds. It would be fair to describe this octagonal building as the world's first weather station. When construction work on the tower finished 2,200 years ago, it was equipped with multiple sundials, a weather vane, and a sort of water clock known as a clepsydra. Nowhere else on the planet would meteorologists have so much technology available to them. Friezes depicting each of the eight ancient Greek wind gods exist on each of the building's eight sides, complete with vertical sundials still capable of telling the time today. The building is thought to have been converted into a church during the early Christian era, during which the space directly outside was used as a cemetery. It then became a place of worship for Muslims during the Ottoman era. It wasn't until a restoration project in 1837 that it was finally restored to its original purpose. You might not have been able to use the Tower of Winds to forecast the long-term weather, but it could at least tell you which way the wind was blowing. While we're extolling the virtues of ancient Greek inventors, we should also thank them for the invention of the crane. It would be impossible to build modern skyscrapers without cranes, but the towering tools are still built to similar principles as those used by the Greeks when they came up with the idea about 2,600 years ago. The Greeks weren't making skyscrapers back then, of course, but found cranes very useful when they were erecting large statues. They wouldn't have been capable of lifting the substantial weights that we expect cranes to lift today, though. For a start, they were made from wood rather than steel. Also, there's the issue of providing power to the cranes. We rely on engines and electronics for that today. But back then, most of the lifting power was provided by horses. They were still the most efficient way of putting together large structures, though, and the idea eventually spread to the Roman Empire, evolving into the three-poly Greco-Roman Tripostos model and then the five-poly Pentaspostos model as they became more advanced and sophisticated. Even an idea as simple as the invention of the spearhead has to come from somewhere. It seems that somewhere might have been Sweden during the Mesolithic era, some 10,000 years ago. Spearheads already existed in other parts of the world by this point, but not like the one that was found in a Swedish peat bog in January 2011. Note how it has four triangular flint points attached to the body of the spear with resin. The weapon is very small, 
so it might even be more accurate to describe it as an arrowhead rather than a spearhead. The small, sharp pieces of flint attached to the wooden body are sometimes known as microliths. Weapons of a vaguely similar design have been found elsewhere in Sweden, both before and after this discovery. But those discoveries tend to be much larger in scale than this one. This specific weapon design appears to be specific to this part of the world, and isn't even present elsewhere in Scandinavia, let alone wider Europe. The design had long since been abandoned by the times the Vikings had come along, which is probably a shame. A weapon like this would still have been useful to the legendary warrior race. Three different ancient inventors claim to have come up with the idea of the odometer. An odometer design is described by Heron of Alexandria in his Dioptra. Vitruvius came up with the design for an odometer a little over 2,000 years ago, but may have been working on an earlier design by Archimedes. In any event, it's the Vitruvian design that's generally thought to have been the first working model. His odometer was basically a wheelbarrow with one wheel full of large pebbles. Every time the wheel rotated, it dropped a pebble into the wheelbarrow. So long as the owner of the device knew the exact circumference of the wheel, they would also be able to work out how far they'd traveled by counting the number of pebbles in the wheelbarrow. This invention proved crucial in determining the exact distance between locations, which was enormously useful knowledge for Roman military commanders. Map making also became much easier after the odometer was invented. The odometer in your car might not drop pebbles in the road to keep track of how far you've driven, but the principles it uses aren't entirely dissimilar to this. Here's another invention that's sometimes credited to Heron of Alexandria, but should more accurately be credited to Philo of Byzantium. It's a personalized robotic servant for the home, and it was invented 2,300 years ago. That seems too ludicrous a suggestion to be true, but here's the proof. Both Heron and Philo wrote full schematics of their inventions, which explain exactly how the shuffling robots worked. They were built for one function only, which was to pour wine into the waiting cup of an impressed house guest. Each humanoid statue-like robot had wheels and a brake. When the brake was released by a human handler, the robot rolled towards guests. When a guest placed a cup into the robot's empty hand, the cup would depress a latch, which, in turn, caused the robot to tilt the pitcher of wine in its other hand and pour liquid into the cup. The device is so sophisticated that it could even tell when a cup was full because of the weight, and so would automatically stop pouring when a certain weight had been achieved. To Philo, the purpose of the automatons was little more than amusement. Still though, we know many people who'd love to have their own robotic wine servants here in the 21st century. Philo might have been fond of party tricks and cheap stunts, but he was also undoubtedly a genius. When he wasn't inventing funny wine robots, he was busy coming up with the world's first thermometer. It doesn't look much like the thin device you might have hung on your wall at home today, but it works essentially the same way. Philo's thermometer is a hollow lead sphere connected to a lead pipe using a tight seal. The other end of the pipe was twisted and then kept below water in a second vessel. We'll let Philo himself explain how it works. In his own words, the air enclosed in the hollow sphere passes out of the tube when the sphere is exposed to the sun. That's evidenced in the water in the second vessel bubbling as hot air rises through it. When the vessel cools, the water would then rise and pass through the tube. He noted that the same effect was achieved regardless of the source of the heat recording experiments with fire and pouring boiling water on the lead vessel's outer surface. Philo's thermometer wasn't capable of recording temperatures, but it was the starting point of developing a device that could. We've looked at a couple of devices that Heron of Alexandria didn't invent, so let's give him some credit by looking at one he did. Every time you use a vending machine to get yourself a drink or a midday snack, you're using one of Heron's inventions. That's right, 
The concept of the vending machine has been around since the first century. Heron came up with the concept as a way of regulating the dispensing of holy water in temples. The Greek priests of the era had an issue with parishioners giving little or no money in temple tax, and then taking too much holy water without paying for it. Heron fixed that problem. His device worked by containing holy water inside a cylindrical device. When a coin was inserted into the device, it landed on a tray and applied pressure to a crank, which opened a valve and released water. The coin would eventually slide off, causing the lever to snap back into place and then shut off the water. Every worshiper got precisely one coin's worth of holy water, and those who didn't pay got nothing at all. For a human being to spend a lot of time underwater, a diving suit is required. It might surprise you to know that the invention of the modern diving suit can be traced all the way back to Leonardo da Vinci. It's just that da Vinci's version of a diving suit looks like something from a horror movie. Unusually for da Vinci, who was usually a very rational man, he never actually created a real-world version of the suit. He drew up these schematics but refused to share the details with anyone and wouldn't make one himself because he was convinced they would somehow be used for evil. Quite how he thought that would work is unclear, but it's possible he envisioned whole armies using his suits to cross the oceans and wage war in foreign lands. Because he was so reluctant to provide full details, we don't know for sure how the suits would have connected to a supply of air. Some pictures appear to show tubes connected to a disc floating on the water whereas others suggest that the divers would carry a pocket of air inside a diving bell. In theory, the suits would have been viable. It's odd that da Vinci was so concerned that someone might use his diving suits for evil purposes. It's not as if he had reservations about coming up with other military ideas. You could even say that the Renaissance master came up with the machine gun. It wouldn't have been much use as a rapid-fire device, but would have allowed multiple shots to be fired in a single instance. The device da Vinci drew looks like an enormous fan with 12 gun barrels. It would have had a wide field of fire, making it perfect for deployment against an advancing army. The gun's wheels would have made it highly maneuverable on the battlefield, and the primary wooden construction would have been comparatively lightweight for transportation. The cleverest thing about the design is that the barrels are arranged into three tiers. The top tier can be fired while the second tier is being loaded, and then the third tier can be loaded while the second is fired. By that point, the top tier should have cooled down enough to be used again. There's no record of the device ever actually being used on a battlefield, but we're not sure why. It looks like it should have worked. Back in 1948, an ancient Viking navigation device was found in the ruins of an 11th century convent in Unartok, Greenland. According to archaeologists, the surprisingly sophisticated compass could be considered the ancient ancestor to modern-day GPS systems. Having taken its name from where it was found, the device is now known as the Unartok Disk, it's thought that ancient Viking mariners used disks like this to travel across the 1,600 miles of sea that separated Greenland and Norway. Only half of the original disk still exists, but it's thought that it once had a pin sticking out of its center that would have cast a shadow, thus indicating the directions relative to the sun. When combined with sunstones, another ancient Viking invention, the disk would have been capable of providing navigational assistance even after the sun went down. The margin of error is a mere 4 degrees, which is more accurate than relying on stars and is, in fact, within the margin of error you might expect from a magnetic compass. It's hard to know how much of this to believe based on the discovery of just half of one single Unartok disk, but the archaeologists and historians who've studied it are confident of their findings. Even more contentious than the Unartok disk is the Nimrud lens. 
This humble lump of rock crystal has been hailed by some as the world's first telescope. It's certainly capable of magnifying objects, but what historians can't agree on is whether the magnification effect was used for stargazing, looking at objects from a long distance, or starting fires by magnifying the sun's rays. Perhaps it was used for all three. The device is also sometimes known as the Layard lens and was found in the ruins of an Assyrian palace in Iraq in 1850. The lens has been polished and carefully shaped into its current form, so whatever it was used for, it wasn't created by accident. It's also probably not a coincidence that its magnification factor of three times is the same as the power of the world's first proper telescope, which was invented in the Netherlands in 1608. By that time, the Nimrod lens had already existed for 2,600 years. What stops us from saying with certainty that it was an early form of telescope is the fact that it's unique. No other Nimrod lenses have ever been found. That's a mystery in itself. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!